The wild and sometimes nasty world of divorce can be tempered by experts known as mediators. We'll talk about that next on Due Process. Major funding for Due Process is provided by Mead Lexus of Southfield and Mead Lexus of Lakeside, offering a large selection of new and pre-owned certified premium vehicles. Someday, cars will use infrared to monitor the driver's face and alert them when they're not paying attention to the road ahead. The first ever HS Hybrid from Lexus. And by WWJ News Radio 950, keeping you up to date with the latest news, traffic, weather, sports, and business information 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Thank you. I'm Henry Baskin, and this is Due Process. Today we're going to talk about a now frequently used role in divorce called mediation. Mediation is something that requires a firm hand, a sound mind, and people with you know, a lot of calm nerves. And toward that end, we've invited two experts. One of them is Ronald Bookholder. Uh, from the law offices of Ronald Bookholder. Welcome to Due Process. Thank you. And I must congratulate you on your Lifetime Achievement Award from the Family Law Section of the uh, State Bar of Michigan. Thank you, Henry. It was well-deserved. I mean, you put in a lot of time uh, and a lot of good time helping people get through the process. Antoinette Rahim, uh, I'm going to call you Tony. Please do. And uh, you're, you spend a lot of time helping people resolve their difficulties out of court. Yes, that's my goal. And that's your goal, to keep it out of court. Sure. Uh, we'll be joined later by uh, a, another person who helps, oh, just sort of keep the noise level down and help people steer through this, uh, the world of, of child parenting. And uh, he's been very helpful, but we'll get to him in a bit. Let me, let me ask you, um, how, do you, how do you get people to agree to mediate instead of going to war and calling each other names in court and do things like that? Well, first of all, there's two different types of mediation that, that, are, that are done. One's called early stage, which I think, um, if I can, Tony will, will talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. And then there's the uh, type of mediation that the court uh, requires uh, after you've done, uh, gone through the process, done what I call discovery. And that's the type of mediation that I involve myself mostly in. Mm -hmm. And I'm appointed uh, by other attorneys um, that agree on me to act as a facilitator to assist people to come to agreements. Okay. Now, okay. Now, Tony, you get the case before they get to that process. It's a different kind of mediation. Well, I don't know how different Ron and I are when you get right down to the nitty gritty. But it's, but it's I, early intervention. I though. generally get my cases earlier. And for me, that's better because once the war starts, it's harder to rein the parties in from my perspective. So oftentimes the parties will come to me either because they have been suggest it has been suggested by the court mm -hmm. or they might just have done some research on the internet of course these days people find so much information themselves that the parties may decide that they've heard about this mediation process they want to try it for themselves before sometimes they even go to attorneys so, so I was so going to ask you that do they come in with attorneys or by sometimes themselves sometimes they do but often they do not okay now you can't represent both. You can just I don't be, represent either. Be be the neutral. Correct. And talk about uh, the highs and lows of where they're going. But well, what I do is to help them to add, to think about the issues they need to think about. If legal issues come up that they aren't sure about, they are quickly advised to go get an attorney to consult consult with them about those issues. And oftentimes, even when they have attorneys, their attorneys will tell them, you don't need me to help you decide who gets Bobby on Wednesday and who gets Sally on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Those are issues between you and your, uh, and your spouse. Okay. You don't even need, attorneys don't even need, sometimes suggested they don't even need to be at the mediation. Okay. Uh, and this all goes on, as Ryan suggested, there's something called discovery where people try to find out the value of assets and what assets there are, what bank accounts there are. But you get involved at that stage also, but also you get involved before, right? Yes. And um, you had much success in getting people to understand that even though, one, well, I guess 
it's hard to find two people who want a divorce at the same time, and they may want it at different times, but you, are these people both committed to a divorce when they come to see you? Well, committed may not be the best word. Sometimes people are resigned to it, but mm -hmm. at any rate, oftentimes someone would bring up the, will bring up the idea of a divorce, and it'll be many months later before they actually take the steps to begin the, the, the legal process or the actual putting aside, separating their assets. So okay. people usually give each other time to do what they need to do to get used to the idea. Okay, now with Ron, y you have people come to you, the court appoints or will suggest that you be the mediator. Uh, based on your record of having settled cases. That's sort of important to the court because it clogs the court system to have trials. And, and people don't want trials, really. I think the vast majority of people want to resolve issues before they get to court. Um, one of the um, things that is very, very important why courts send to mediation is you will hear judges often say, I'm going to know less about your case than you do. Mm -hmm. And this gives a non-binding opportunity for the people to have a sense of certainty with regard to issues by virtue of they'll have counsel, um, the mediator will act as a neutral facilitator and will work with the, the parties and their attorney to try to overcome the impasses that may have existed that didn't allow people to settle cases before then. You know, some of the impasses are, uh, those of us in the, in the field know that people will argue over grandma's table or where the ashes of your great uncle are going to be buried and things such as that. We usually can resolve those things, but when it comes to the new divorce where people are not working or have lost their pensions and, and there's a new movement out to eliminate spousal support uh, in other states and things such as that, how do you address it? How do you convince the attorneys, Ron, that your way is, is the best way to get, get it resolved? Well, first of all, I don't know if it's my way. Um, the, I think the important thing to understand is that by the time that usually I end up seeing them, um, consul usually have tried to communicate to resolve issues, and there are certain impasses. And what I do, and I let them know up front, is that I will talk to them separately. What they tell me, if they tell me it's confidential, I keep confidential. Okay. And I move back and forth between um, the parties and their consul until I can get a global resolution. So they're in different rooms. The, the sometimes they are, sometimes we do it all in the same room. Oh really, well, Raheem, do you s see the people separately? Very little. Much of the, most of the mediations are with the parties in the same room. And the reason for that is because I found that there is something almost miraculous about the ability to soften one's position when one understands the other person and really listens to what the other person is concerned about. So it's and, almost like being a marriage counselor in a sense. Well, I don't know that it is that. It is helping people to resolve their own mm -hmm. concerns and issues. And if that's what a marriage counselor does, well, I suppose. Do, do so. they ever walk out hand in hand and say? No, I won't go that far. No, they won't. That doesn't <laughs> but I, I was just telling Ron, I just had a mediation last week where the parties had lived together in the same house with three children and for the past, they have been married 10 years, but for the past 20 months they said they had not spoken to each other. They had just, he lived in the basement and she lived upstairs and they shuttled the kids between each other and literally oh. had not spoken. After five hours of mediation, we got most of the issues resolved. They agreed to come back for another session to wrap things up and they were actually being nice to each other. They, I think they were waiting to say things to each other that they hadn't said in oh, quite that's some time. interesting because y you mentioned the children were shuttled back and forth. And, and with us today uh, by remote is, is Robert Arard, who is in a very tough area, of the, mostly the parenting area. You've used him. Uh, Bob, Absolutely. welcome to Due Process. Thank you. Uh, you've, you've used Dr. Arard. Absolutely. You, you know not, Dr. Not, not this particular. Well, he, he, is <laughs> he has to deal with some of the thorniest issues that I can imagine. I mean, it, it has to do with parenting. It has to do with custody. It has to do with visitation. And Bob, uh, 
Do you start your process by bringing the attorneys in or bringing the people in? How, how do you do that? Uh, generally, I like to meet with uh, both parents together uh, without the attorneys. Uh, okay. And we'll sit down and we'll kind of go over the ground rules for how parent coordination will work. And usually it's in the context of a court order that really specifies uh, what my role is and, and responsibilities and what the parent's responsibilities are. And they are. call you a parenting coordinator? Uh, yes, there are other names, sometimes parenting facilitator, parenting and time coordinator. And they call it's you other names too, same. I'm sure. I, I'm sorry? And they call you other names too. Uh, yes, uh, occasionally they do, especially <laughs> once they leave the office. I, I, <laughs> Yeah, I think I was on uh, the committee, um, I think Bob may have been on it too, that uh, created an order for Oakland County that a lot of attorneys use. And usually what Bob sees is highly contentious cases and yeah. most of the parenting coordinators that I know do not have attorneys sitting there. Uh, Bob is a skilled um, uh, psychologist that can assist high conflict uh, to try to take well, the heat out of situations. Yeah, when you talk about high conflict, I mean, I, I, it seems to be the last vestige uh, of divorce, the, the, who gets the children, who, who spends the most time, who spends the least time, uh, what happens on holidays, what happens on birthdays, and all that stuff that frankly drives attorneys to the edge. That's why they come to see you as a psychologist, I suppose. Well, and usually I see them after the ink is almost dry on the actual judgment of divorce. So at right. this point, the attorneys have kind of faded into the background. The court really doesn't want to see them again. But it's amazing, no matter how carefully, how thoroughly the attorneys drafted the judgment of divorce, there are issues that came up they do come up that nobody ever anticipated. Uh, can I uh, little ambiguities, little loopholes, and the parents who really never divorced just because they got the, the paper signed, they want to keep going at it hammer and tongs. Oh, go ahead, Ryan. Uh, my, my comment is that the courts and attorneys do not want to micromanage and cannot micromanage everyday events which occur between parties or disagreements. And that's where a parenting coordinator may come in, um, as opposed to uh, no, normally a parenting coordinator will not deal with a change of, quote, custody um, or a change of parenting time, but maybe a specific issue where um, mom wants to take the children to Florida on dad's time, um, and maybe uh, the parenting coordinator will make some recommendation and try to get the people to well, agree. Does a parenting coordinator, Bob, do you have the authority to make a binding decision for the welfare of the children? Uh, technically, no. Uh, under the Michigan Domestic Relations Arbitration Statute, yeah. only an attorney can do that and only under some very, very stringent conditions. Right. And even right. then it's reviewable by the court. <laughs> but quite often the orders will say, in effect, that the parent coordinator will make the call until they get to court uh, to talk to the judge and most of the time the issue isn't large enough to go to court on and and they'll uh, go along with what the parent coordinator recommends but what I try to do is not keep solving their problems for them ultimately ultimately my job is to teach them how to work together to solve problems and make myself obsolete okay let me ask you this do these people if they're well motivated if they love their children They'll make it easy on them. I, I, I just, I see such interesting, intense battles about splitting Christmas Day and, and splitting Christmas Eve and, and, and having kids fly to Chicago and fly back. They, some of these kids have more airline miles than the pilots, and they stay awake too, by the way. The point is, is it fair to put the kids in this kind of situation I mean, it just seems that everybody is looking at it, not through the eyes of the kids, but through the eyes of the parents, trying to satisfy them. And, and, I, and it's about, it should be about satisfying the child's needs, I would think. Well, there are parents who are inclined to treat their children like property, and they want to make sure that they get every little bit that they're entitled to, no matter what. But mm -hmm. most of the time, in my experience, these parents are really quite sincere that they believe they're fighting for the best interest of their child, and they don't really trust the other parent. Okay, do they really? Is that because there was a day when, uh, after they passed no fault, the divorce, people fought over the last thing to fight over, and that had to do with the children, and they were using the children 
to leverage better settlements. They say, well, if you don't ask for joint custody, uh, I'll give you this or I'll take that. I think that um, custody in and of itself is just a, is a name. Uh, where it's really at is parenting time and who has what kind of parenting time, quality parenting time with the kids. And a parenting coordinator, as I think, and Bob's an excellent one, uh, tries to assist them to take the heat out of the, 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 the well, furnace and, and, and get them to agree if they can so it doesn't have to go back to court. Well, Tony, here, here's the point. There was a time, probably before you started practicing law, that, that we didn't have parenting coordinators. We didn't have anything but the lawyers and the judges making these decisions and the friend of the court. Mm -hmm. And these were tough decisions. Do these people that come to see you initially understand that their children are in peril? Well, I was taught by somebody who I have a lot of respect for, Zena Zometa. And one of the things she told me to start off in mediation is to tell the parents we want you to imagine that you're 15 years ahead. Your daughter, who is now 10 or so, is just getting ready to get married. Right. And she comes to you and says to you both parents, you know, when you and Dad got, mar got divorced 15 years ago, I was really worried that my life was going to be miserable, that you were going to fight all the time, I was going to be caught in the middle. But you didn't do that, Mom and Dad. You made it so, even though you were divorced, I didn't suffer for it. For it. What was your secret? And then we turn toward the parents in the mediation and say, what would you tell your kids? What are some principles that you want to live your life by so that in 15 years your kids will be able to come to you and say that? And we sit down and we write those principles down. Yeah, well, now you're dealing with rational people, but we're going we're gonna to take a break. Bob, stay with us, would you please? Sure. I know you're enjoying the sun and the surf wherever you're at, but We'll be right back. We're going to take a break. Be right back talking about mediation, arbitration, parenting, and all that goes with it. Legal referrals and more information on this and other related topics are available on our website at www.dueprocess.tv. There you'll find information on today's program, helpful hints to legal issues, support materials, and lawyer referrals. You can also stream previous episodes of Due Process. Thank you. We're back on Due Process talking uh, with Ronald Bookholder and uh, Tony uh, Rahim and Bob Arard. Thanks for staying with us. I, uh, I have to tell you that we talked about high-conflict high divorces at the break. Uh, in, in those kinds of cases, did you ever throw up your hands and say, I can't help you people? Well, one of the rules that I abide by is that a mediator never gives up. If people oh, okay. leave the mediation telling me that they're through, I call them the next week, and then I call them two weeks later, and then I call them a month and later. do they come back in? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they actually do. Sometimes they don't. Or they resolve it on their own without having to come back. The, you know, the other side of this is, you know, I see people that I think are reasonable as well, or they want to be reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, what you hope is that the attorney that they have it wants to generate reasonable resolutions, but people have differing ideas. And what I find is that um, in the type of mediation I do, which I don't think Tony can, sometimes I will discuss with them privately a cost-benefit analysis because we're the last best hope in the mediation, in the later stage mediation. Otherwise, they end up going to court. And just as Tony mentioned, I like to tell a story about children, especially where children are involved, mm -hmm. where the little child is sitting on the stage. And do you want your child to be that child crying on the stage when the teacher comes up and says, what's wrong? And the child looks up and says, if I run to mom, dad's going to be mad. If I run to dad, mom's going to be mad. And the same sense. You, if you have children, are going to be with special events with these children lifelong. And right. if you care about your children, you're going to want to resolve issues where there can be civility between the parties. Yeah, but the problem is, and Bob, you hear this all the time, uh, where we have situations, as Ron describes, where we have sporting events, we have soccer, so mom and dad are going to be there. Right. Uh, dad thinks mom is a bitch and mom thinks dad is, is a bad guy. Okay, and this goes on after they're divorced. And you have to sit in there, get them in a room, and resolve these issues. How do you do that? Well, <clears throat> they're all always going to say, 
I'm really here for my child. And so it starts that way, right? It starts that way, mm -hmm. and and that's part of the leverage that that uh, I try to use is to explain to them that there are all kinds of advantages and dis disadvantages that different ways of doing things may bring to their child, but the biggest disadvantage they can possibly bring to their child is to keep that child caught in the middle in a divorce that never ends. But it, 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 but what's happened here over time? The paradigm has changed. Fathers used to get every other weekend. Fathers never had, as they said, equal rights. Uh, now we're into, and we call it parenting. We don't even call it custody, we call it parenting. There's joint legal custody and there's parenting, right? Correct. We, we don't say uh, you have custody. The Custody Act does not mention what's called joint legal custody or joint mm -hmm. physical custody. There's custody. And some people use, you know, what does joint legal custody right. mean? Because we right. see it in our judgments all the time. And that's the ability to communicate on significant decisions between parties, such as where they're going to go to school uh, and the, maybe their medical decisions. Right. It gives them the right to get right. school records and things such as that. And exactly. Which they should. But the joint legal custody, it, is that, that was, um, there's been a, a, a big shift and how people perceive it. It is very difficult to get a traditional mother to think that half the time is going to be spent with the father after divorce and half the time with the mother. They just won't accept it. They don't believe it. And I don't know how you get them and how you get them and how you get them to believe that this is the way it is. Well, one of the things that many women are much busier these days than maybe they were historically. Well, that's true. Economically, <laughs> we, things have changed. And a lot of women recognize, and maybe sometimes you have to encourage them to think about it, that they really want to help with raising the children. They really want well, they really the want other, a weekend off, the other, too. Exactly. Some mm -hmm. time for themselves. So when you get them to look at the big picture and seeing that they may be hurting themselves by trying to have total custody, right. I think oftentimes people tend to come around. Right. You've seen a change in the last 20 years, haven't you? Absolutely. I think that, uh, first of all, you see more women working. In the legal profession, there are probably more women going into the law oh, than men. Law school we see has it. more women than, than men. We see it all the time. And I think that the uh, recognition, if you're concerned with your child, the less conflict you have between each other, the better off your children are going to be. I think Bob would tell you that. But more importantly than that, um, I think that there is more of a recognition in the court system. Uh, they take a look uh, at the children, where they are developmentally, um, what the relationships are. And a lot of men, there are men who are um, stay-at-home dads, right, where the, uh, the, the, the women work at this point. Bob, you, you've been in it for a few years. You, you've seen the change too, haven't you? Yes, and uh, one of the changes that uh, really makes a, a powerful difference, and it's, it's not that recent a change, is that joint legal custody is pretty much presumed in, in right. most Michigan courts, even though it's not technically there in the law. And that means that the parents, regardless of their parenting time, have equal decision-making power over big issues involving the kids. Well, because they presume it, even though sometimes these people really can't get along at all and have no respect for each other. Parent coordination has grown up as a way of helping people to make decisions who really can't make decisions together. There's another part of this equation. It has to do when people remarry, uh, not remarry each other, but when they get married, subsequent marriages, other children, other schedules, and on and on and on. Now, certainly you all deal with that and say, well, now what if she marries this man whose his own parenting time is different than her parenting time and things okay. such as that? Now, I don't know how you get into that, but it's, a, it's an entire field of law as far as I can see it. It's easy to split up a bank account. It's really easy to do that. It's easy to sell a house and, well, not now it isn't, but it was easy to sell a house and, and divide the money. But, but getting the kids straightened out is, is, is foremost. Ron, Ron, yes, he takes credit for, for forcing Governor Engler to sign the uh, arbitration uh, statute. Uh, and it's a statute. Mm -hmm. Supreme Court wouldn't pass it. I take credit for writing the Child Custody Act uh, back in 1970. So we have, we have two people here, and, 
and someone who is listening to us talk about, hey, these guys have been doing this forever. I don't care to be involved in custody. It's the hardest thing for a lawyer to do today is to try and resolve custody issues. That's my take. Uh, I think that's accurate. It's probably the most uh, difficult emotionally on the parties. It's terrible as far as the kids are concerned. Oh, God, we're out of time. I'm going to have to wrap it up. Thank you, Robert Erard. Thank you, Raheem. I, uh, I, I, Antoinette, I think that uh, you're going to enjoy this practice. A lot. Thank you very much. Ron, keep up the good work. Thank, Thank you very much. And Henry, uh, congratulations because he was a predecessor. He has a lifetime achievement. Major funding for due process is provided by Mead Lexus of Southfield and Mead Lexus of Lakeside, offering a large selection of new and pre-owned certified premium vehicles. Someday, cars will use infrared to monitor the driver's face and alert them when they're not paying attention to the road ahead. The first ever HS Hybrid from Lexus. And by WWJ News Radio 950, keeping you up to date with the latest news, traffic, weather, sports, and business information 24 hours a day, 7 days a week.